For today's interview, I used an artificial intelligence tool for the introduction text. There we go. In this interview, we explore the transformative potential of technological innovations such as QR codes, blockchain technology, artificial intelligence and digital product passports in revolutionizing value chains. These advancements have the capacity to bolster transparency and sustainability, reshaping how products are sourced, produced and delivered while meeting the demands of a more conscientious and eco-friendlier world. Now, that was not a bad introduction, but time for a reality check with Michael Siebold of Merck and Alexander Wegener of Opesis. Let's start with the QR codes. Can you provide some examples of industries that have successfully implemented the QR code technology to enhance supply chain transparency and consumer information? Sure, so with regard to the QR code, I would also like to add that the quick response code is only one example for so-called two-dimensional codes. So we also have other ones and also then starting with some examples, we have the UDI, which is a specific one we have in the medical device arena, where traceability of products are key, where we're looking also especially into the question of expiry dates, also the question of um, counterfeiting is in the center as we also embed here some serials numbers which cannot easily be copied. We then have uh, so-called DMCs, for example, in the automotive industry. Once we are looking for assembly of um, complex machinery, for example, and of course in the chemical industry, we have the drug safety questions for the secondary packaging on drugs and in the chemicals industry. Then we have, of course, on the labeling of the products, the DMC, which is giving a huge wealth of information for the users to provide safety and sustainability during handling, transport and storage of chemicals. Okay. Alex, you want to add something there? But just saying that um, it's absolutely worthwhile to think <coughs> and take a step back and uh, see what, what a QR code or any other barcode can supply to us. It can help provide additional information to a physical object. And that's basically it. And that uh, opens a wealth of options. Okay. And in what ways can those 2D barcodes or QR codes support sustainability by providing information on product origins or ingredients or environmental impact? So if you're looking, for example, in a lab use, you need an easy scanner, which could be, for example, also a smartphone. Then you're going over the code and then you are getting based on the nomenclature you have in, for example, the DMCs. You can see from which company, you can see the expiry date, you can see also other information which is then related to safety questions, so you can get updated classification and labeling information. So that's more or less the starting point, as already said, where all the information we have available also the experts are working on, where we're setting up a complete environment of data which are real-time, that this is connected to the real use at point of use where decisions need to be made. That's the big advantage of any kind of, of, of barcode. And especially coming maybe a little back to the QR code, this is very much prominent in the B2C business, because the QR code is also able to go with um, double digit characters, so also kanji is able, but uh, the industry standard for sure is uh, the data matrix code, the DMC. Okay, uh, Michael, uh, Alex refers uh, to B2C, huh? business to consumer. You are also a consumer. Did you ever use a QR code on a product? Absolutely. Like what? Like, uh, for example, looking at a product and wanting to learn more about the nutrients in their ingredients, calories, whatever. Or also, I mean, it's kind of, I'm biased there, but also getting sustainability information on products. No, I fair. mean, there, there are apps that do that today. So, yeah. Great, great. Or picking up manuals. Or picking up manuals. <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> real men don't need uh, manuals. They real men trying. don't need manuals, <laughs> but do real men need blockchain technology? Huh? Basically a decentralized database. How does blockchain technology enable end-to-end -end visibility in supply chains and what are the advantages of such a transparency? 
Well, the transparency comes from the blockchain being immutable, non-deletable. So uh, it's there forever. And that's the big advantage of it, you know, like it's really reliable in that regard. Okay, um, but I guess there are also challenges uh, uh, related to blockchain technology. Huh? So what are they and how can they be overcome? Well, the challenges are it's immutable, non-deletable, and uh, therefore it's very reliable. And as a, as a company, you really have to think about if you want that. You know, if you want to put data information there, that will be there forever to see and not to be altered. Yeah. So that's the biggest risk. It's, it is there, so be very careful what you put there. But if you put it there, it can be very advantage. I, I agree on that. Yeah. You also have to think about um, who is uh, the governor of that blockchain you're putting it on. There are public blockchains and there are private blockchains. If you put it in a public blockchain, that is also to some degree out of your control. It's typically community controlled, so um, yeah, you also have to make sure that you choose the right blockchain to put your data in. Okay, great. How can artificial intelligence have a positive impact on the value chains of the chemical industry? So artificial intelligence is directly linked to big data because artificial intelligence is nothing else than statistics. So if you are also looking back, um, for example in Germany, the German Institute for Artificial Intelligence, the DFKI, this is founded in 1988. So what we are currently um, making use of is with artificial intelligence that the broad wealth of data we have, which is growing, we furthermore can aggregate to information. The information then is in the context giving the knowledge we need to make as human beings a decision. And that's the advantage of artificial intelligence that our narrowed mind we have as human beings can broaden up that we are able to make use of the entire information which is available and that's also that artificial intelligence must go with big data and real-time data, otherwise it won't work. Alex, you're an expert. What is your view on this? I agree. AI is really very, very good in detecting patterns, even when humans fail at that. You know, um, getting the pic big picture out of big data. Okay, and what are the main barriers for using uh, AI in the chemical industry? I would say one, security, because AI relies on big data, it's hungry for that. And you really need to think about who you want to give your big data. Because some of the data that uh, chemical industry wants to leverage, like compositions, can be very, very confidential. So, and uh, I, I assume that most major companies by this have a policy that um, controls who employees give their data to. Like, don't give it to ChatGPT because they might use that. Okay, and, 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 and trust, I think, is, is relevant. That trust in the algorithm. Should we trust them? Yes. That's yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> too optimistic. <laughs> Gentlemen, great. But, but, but there are conditions, and that's also one of the challenges. I think you have to, as a human, still understand what the algorithm you're trusting is, how that works. What data was it fed with? Yeah. Um, the algorithm in the end will only work as well as the data that you've trained it with. So if the data you've chosen isn't complete, isn't accurate, isn't fair, then um, you will train an algorithm that replicates that. Yeah, in the past, when, when we didn't have algorithms but still data models, eh, it was garbage in is garbage out. That still mm -hmm. applies? or That absolutely still applies, yeah. And, and what do you then need to do to make sure that you put the right content in? Is that really then the, the, the man behind it, uh, the person that, that, that's programming it uh, or selecting it? Or is there also a kind of control afterwards? You can, it's, it's in all steps, you know, when you, when you develop the model, that's where you have to see what you're leveraging there. But then when you get the big data to train that model, how you curate that, 
how you make sure it actually reflects what you want to get to. That's, um, that's another step. And after that, you also have to test and check and see if the model, if the AI produces the results that, it, that you expect it to. Okay. So it depends on the application, I also would say. So artificial intelligence in chemicals industry, once we are talking, for example, about classification and labeling, you can come with a starting point from a SMILES code. And then you can also derive, of course, classification and labeling. You can also then use, once understanding all the natural science with this behind, you can set up a model, a very complex one. And then, of course, you have the data coming out of a lab. So you have lots of somehow valid data you can put in such a training. And then you can grow the AI. The AI then can also control what's coming out of the um, out of the models because the models also do have a domain where they're working good and where they are on weak ground. That's what at the very beginning you do not know. Anyhow, that's what you need to know. Also the AI models, they are also different. So um, it is always a question of the expertise which is coming out of such a system. And it's also once we are hiring an expert. An expert is not an expert. We have to onboard an expert, we have to train the expert. It's continual learning over the whole span of the work life. So it's also a selection of the tools, of the data, of the training and whatever. So AI is nothing else, especially once we are then looking into um, things like neural language. <laughs> it is copying what we are doing. So why are not behaving as this is a human being from a thought process? Anyhow, we are the guys making the decisions. So we are human beings. We are good as being in decision makings. And that's what AI is not doing. Okay, and great. I think that's also one of the disadvantages of AI. It's hyped, it's hyped, it's hyped. And then everybody thinks, okay, I can switch off my brain. And mm -hmm. all responsibilities I have, I'm putting to a tool I do not understand. That's wrong. Okay, interesting. Uh, not completely switching off the brain, but let's step into the virtual reality that is also used in the chemical industry. Have virtual reality applications that can enhance chemical safety. Yeah, for instance, via trainings that allow employees to practice safety procedures, respond uh, to emergency scenarios in a controlled, virtual, digital twin environment. Do you consider those valuable tools? Yes, of course they are. So. If you are looking into trainings, for example, for an operation in, in the QC lab, you can train it. You can train it without being exposed to hazardous chemicals. You can also train um, the disaster in a lab without giving a threat to the people and the environment. You are always up to date. So if all those trainings then directly plug into latest and greatest information which is provided by the producers of a chemical, there is no need also to rewrite whatever SOP for a training. It will be continually updated. Okay. Alex, how can the concept of digital twins assist the chemical industry in becoming more safe, sustainable and transparent? It's a tool, like, uh, like a lot of uh, tools these days, that um, can actually facilitate um, experimenting, I mean, much like the virtual reality, experimenting on things without physically doing it. Yeah? So uh, if I have the, the, the rules, the algorithms, how certain things function, you know, I can do a lot of experiments and try things you know, that I wouldn't uh, be able to try or it would be very expensive to do in the real world. So this is uh, what digital twins can do, to, do for us. Okay, great. Good advantages, I would say. Um, let's focus on advantages of the digital product password. So another topic for advantages for both the manufacturers and consumers and specifically focusing on sustainability and transparency in the value chain. Yeah, let's think about what the digital product passport is. It's, um, it's not completely defined yet, so the regulations are upcoming. 
it's still in discussion. But the general idea is that instead of um, having bits and pieces of information about my product reg regarding its sustainability, I put it in one place. You know, it's, it's, one, it's a flyer of sustainability for my product. And, and, and that's the beauty of it, you know. Um, it can be either defined by the regulatory bodies and say this is what needs to go there, but it can also be just on consumer requests or the company saying, hey, this is what I want to have with my product. You should know that about my product. And saying, okay, for each product that is on the market, we have a passport. That's, that's beautiful. You want to add something? It's directly linked to a product and of course there are lots of, let's say, parallel ideas to a so-called safety data sheet. So information going alongside with a product through the entire life cycle. That's the idea behind. Anyhow, with uh, regard to uh, the product passport, it is merely concentrated on the uh, dimensions of, um, of, of sustainability especially then looking into how can it be repaired, what about spare parts, what is the situation during the recycling of different components. Um, that's the value as I would say the safety data sheet is somehow going more and more into a direction where the information is of no use because it's not adoptable to the as is situation. Okay. For safety data sheets, of course, there are guidelines and formats that you have to follow. Um, you already indicated eh, the, the digital product passport, which is part of the Eco Design for Sustainable uh, Product Regulation, uh, is not really in that phase yet. But should there be a standardized format like for the SDS uh, here in Europe? Yeah, I think there should be some minimums that define what should be in the, in the product passport. And I expect the regulatory bodies to set that standard. Okay, so it's something for the authorities to set, or should yes. there be a company stepping up and making the example that the authorities can follow? Well, <clears throat> that's an interesting question. I think what we are seeing is that um, in certain areas, and I expect digital product passport to go the same way, that there are companies that have a commercial interest in providing solutions, which is good. But also, um, it could be one of the situations where we have this, this marketplace effect, like Amazon or um, similar, you know, uh, Facebook. Um, the more participants you have in a network, the more valuable it is. And we might also see a situation with digital product passports where there's one company that really defines the ecosystem and the standards around that. Whether that's a good thing or not it remains to be seen. Okay. And standardizing has several dimensions. So it is the content on the one hand side and then it's, let's say, the data format. So with regard to the data format, we need to have a standard and we also need to have minimum requirements with regard to the content, but the rest should be free. Final question. What emerging technologies or trends do you see? Could both of you sketch how these new technologies can be connected and integrated in the complex web of the chemical industry's value chain? So let's start by two things we've already talked about today. QR codes and similar codes and a digital product passport like this is the perfect combination. Once again, um, a QR code allows me to link a physical object, whether the packaging or the object itself, with some information that I store somewhere else, like the digital product passport. So that's a trend that I see, um, which will be very helpful to both consumers and industry. And uh, the other trend I see is analytics on big data. We will be able to analyze everything a few years from now. So uh, that's, that's going to be very helpful, also in combination with artificial intelligence. Michael, what is your vision? Everything is connected, what we see in the digital world. And it amplifies each other. That's the positive things. And whatever solution we have in a industry can be also copied or brought into another one. So it's all about data. It's about real-time data. It's about understanding data. It's about sharing data. It's about making decisions out of those data. So it is connecting the digital world with the real world. It is 
giving us the opportunity to make the right decisions in an environment which is a complex, of course, mix of, um, of, of dimensions in the real world and in the, um, in the virtual world, but this will give us the right set of information and knowledge to make the right decisions and everything is moving, everything needs to be adoptive. Michael and Alex, thank you very much for your contribution. I trust this provided our viewers with a virtual glance in the technological opportunities for today and tomorrow. Curious to learn when we can indeed lay back and relax and let our digital AI twin do the main tasks. <laughs>